Good evening. Welcome to the British Library. My name is John. I, I have the pleasure of looking after the events program for the library. And that was our fantasy exhibition. Now, it is unfortunately a few weeks ago that it happened. Uh, but I hope many of you did get to see it while it was on. It was one of our most successful exhibitions for many, many years. Uh, was six, around 60,000 people came to see it, uh, which we were absolutely thrilled about. And so we met some of the nicest people we've ever had at the library. Uh, it was full of books and manuscripts by major fantasy fiction writers. There was films. There were costumes, fan perspectives, uh, video games, and of course tabletop games were a central part of that. And we were absolutely thrilled when uh, Wayland Games came on board to be our major supporters of the exhibition. Um, they are a huge um, online retailer for, for games and wargaming, and uh, we we're absolutely thrilled that they took part. So this is a, like, a little hangover from that exhibition. No, that sounds awful. A little, uh, <laughs> a little extra little bite at the end of the exhibition programme, the rescheduled uh, Dungeons & Dragons celebration. We're absolutely thrilled you can be here, and welcome to everybody watching online, wherever you are around the world. Um, so tonight we've got uh, two incredible speakers for you. Um, we'll have time for questions afterwards. Those here can obviously do the normal thing, put your hand up and wait for the mic. And if you're watching online, you can post questions in the form below the video window. We'll read out some of those later on. Um, we'll also have book signing um, by the great Sir Ian Livingstone outside in the bar. And again, those online, just go to the books tab at the top of the page and you can get a copy of his amazing new book, The Dice Men. Um, so yeah, as I said, we have got two great speakers. We have, of course, Sir Ian Livingstone, founder of the Games Workshop, the man who not quite 50 years ago, brought uh, Dungeons & Dragons to Europe, having, uh, having it, had it launched in the US uh, the year before. And then, of course, Mark Humes as well, who is the, one of the founders of the amazing um, High Rollers uh, pod and streaming um, site. And also, it's, it says here, he's the, the Dungeon Master. So there we go. Um, so he'll be there. And we're also thrilled that we've got uh, Matthew Clayton here to host the two of them. Now, Matthew only stepped in uh, literally the 11th hour last night um, as our chair for the tonight. He is the editor of uh, Dice Man and several of our others of Sir Ian's books uh, at Unbound, and he's previously worked at uh, Random House, The Guardian, and runs a literary tent at the Glastonbury Festival. So uh, please welcome to our stage our speakers. Um, I'm Matthew. I'm Ian. Might guess that's Ian. I'm Mark. Might Hi. guess that's Mark. Um, so we're here to uh, entertain you, hopefully, for the next hour and a bit, and hopefully illuminate in some way, maybe even educate as well. Um, just to explain how it's going to run, how the evening will run, is we're having 15-minute presentations from Ian and then Mark, um, with some slides behind us. And then I'm going to ask them some hopefully engaging questions for about half an hour after that. And then there'll be a chance for all of you to ask questions um, and also for the people that are watching online to ask some questions as well. So it's not just us in the room. There's people um, back there. If we could all wave at the camera to all our friends online back there. <laughs> hopefully there's thousands, tens of thousands of them. Absolutely, definitely. Um, so we had a ve there was a very brief intro there, but I think you both deserve a slightly more fulsome intro. So um, I I'm going to give it now. So Ian is a games designer, author, and entrepreneur. He's kind of um, uh, the kind of geek national treasure, <laughs> um, I'd probably yep. say. The kind of leading geek national treasure. I'm not sure there are. Uh, there are many... Um, uh, other people that can lay claim to that. Obviously, he co-founded Games Workshop with, with um, Steve Jackson in 75. He launched Dungeons and Dragons in Europe, White Dwarf, Warhammer, Citadel, Citadel Miniatures, um, uh, and obviously the, all, all the Games Workshop uh, shops. Um, but after that, then there's like a million and one other things as well. He's done <laughs> I am since. old. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, oh, but, it, but there's an embarrassment of riches after that. I remember... Um, as I helped publish Dyson in the book, of, of talking to him, like, so that's the, that's the end of it. Um, Games Workshop gets closed. And then he just said, then I did this. And then I was involved in this. And it seems to be 
uh, that was really the, this first bit, the kind of first start of a journey that takes you through kind of, um, uh, well, all the way up to the present, really, kind of digital gaming culture in the present, really, that you're this incredible link, I think, from, from the early 70s onwards. Uh, so now I'm going to give Mark a little bit, one, a little bit of a bio here. But he re he wrote this one himself. I did. I did. I've got to tell you this now. So if the kind of ad adverbs in there saying how wonderful he is, um, I'm sure they're all true. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Mark's a dungeon master of one of the largest D and D streams in the world, which is High Rollers. He's one of the founding members of it. How many of you are there? How many of you in the there gang? Are six of us now. Five when it started. Six now. Um, but you're also the dungeon master for Knights of Evening Star on the official D and D Twitch stream. I did that? Did that get lots more than the high rollers? Or were you? No, that was. It was a little bit smaller, but it was a really great community and things right. like that. I, I didn't write actually this bit. I think they've tweaked it a little they bit. They tweaked. <laughs> I didn't oh put that God. in. It um, <laughs> was very exciting. And also, uh, and my son was very excited because you were also um, you put together Baldur's Gate cast play game. Yeah, I um, did. Yeah. Uh, and you're also a tabletop RPG writer and designer. You've worked with Wizards of the Coast um, on Canal Geek Mysteries. And uh, you may well know that he's created lots of um, YouTube videos. Yeah. And streamed. How many hours are streaming? Oh, I don't even want to think at this point. Uh, too many. Far too many. <laughs> have, you, have you streamed in? I scream, not scream. <laughs> <laughs> have, you, have, you, have, you, have you done it at all? You must no. have. You must have. You're not being, you must have been invited on a stream. Maybe I should start my own. Uh, <laughs> you should. You should. You should. Yeah, absolutely should. Um, okay, right. Let's get on with it. Ian, you're on first. You've got okay. 15 minutes. Thanks. Give or take. Clock's ticking. Yeah, however long, how long, however long it takes. We won't interrupt. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I can see you now. That's brilliant. Um, I'm going to talk about, obviously, D&D &D and uh, my life in games and particularly D&D in the early years of Games Workshop. Um, you know, for me, it has been nearly 50 years since we started Games Workshop in 1975, in January to be precise. I'll talk about that, but of course we're here to talk about more than anything else, Dungeons and & Dragons and how it came about and why it was such a phenomenon and what happened to that phenomenon today. Obviously, Mark's going to tell us more about how he plays his amazing campaigns uh, to millions of people around the world who can watch him play. But where did it all start? Well, it started really, I guess, um, nearly 100 years ago through Toy Soldiers because there was a gentleman, the co-designer of D&D, &D, Dave Arneson, was a member of a war game society in Minneapolis. And they used to play this game called Braunstein, uh, which was invented by uh, David Wesley. It's a kind of Napoleonic war game. And um, Arneson's idea was to, when he took it over, because Wesley went into the army, to introduce a kind of individual roles um, for if there, was, if there was too many people playing. So one someone could be a mayor or a banker or something as an individual in part of that war game. So that first bit of individuality in a game really stemmed from that. Um, he went to Gen Con 2 in... Uh, I think it was 1969, that's where he met Gary Gygax. And Gygax had written this set of uh, military combat rules called J Chainmail, but it had a fantasy supplement in the back with lots of wizards and, and characters and creatures and stuff. And Arneson was fascinated by that kind of fantasy supplements. So he applied some of those characteristics to Braunstein to make it a kind of personalised war game, which he then created and called Blackmoor. And Gygax had heard about Blackmoor and said, um, can I play? And he invited Arneson to play it. And they thought this is amazing. He said, can I have a copy of the rules? But they didn't exist. <laughs> there were no rules. It was just basically storytelling by Arneson. Uh, and so Gygax says, I'll do it myself. So he took some of the concepts from Arneson, applied some of the combat results tables and some of the combat rules from Chainmail and wrote 50 pages of rules, which was D&D. &D. But he didn't have a publisher um, because it was such a, a phenomenon of, of, a, of a game. So he set up his own company, TSR Hobbies, with an old friend of his, uh, Don Kay, uh, in 1973. And ultimately, they printed 1,000 copies of 
what is now called the wood grain box um, of D&D, which came out in 1974. So there's always been a bit of a debate who did what about D&D, and I find it quite fascinating <laughs> because we just assume D&D, we don't really think about often about the people behind some of these classic games that were made in those days, and more recently, because it's, they are great creative achievements, but we don't always celebrate the people behind them. So I think it's quite interesting, but I don't think anyone really knows the percentage. The kind of general take is that the, the kind of that Arnson introduced storytelling in games and had an idea for the role-playing principle, but it was only an idea. And it was Gygax who took that idea and turned it into a product uh, of clearly a very successful product. Um, so that's kind of a kind of rough history of the origin. My own story uh, goes back to, this is January 1975. I was sharing a flat in Shepherd's Bush with two old school friends, John Peake in the middle and Steve Jackson on the far side. I'm the handsome guy on this side. <laughs> and um, we had pretty boring, low-paid jobs and thought, wouldn't it be great if we could somehow turn our hobby of playing board games into some sort of fledgling business? So John was a a craftsman as well as being a civil engineer, and he made these worry boards and backgammon boards and, and other boards, and I'd sell them to game shops, and Steve would do the admin. But our hearts weren't really in those traditional classic games, so we decided to publish a magazine, um, this full-color, high-glossy magazine here <laughs> called Owl and Weasel, um, of which we printed uh, less than 100 copies. Uh, we sent it out to everybody we knew in games. And somehow, miraculously, don't know to this day how it happened, one copy of it landed on Gary Gygax's desk in Lake Geneva. And we'd, been, we'd played it um, at the City Games Club, or we'd seen it being played earlier that month. And then this arrived, because we didn't know where to get it. We were supposed to send us some post box in, in Wisconsin, wherever that was. And um, so, but we, we had one in our, in our hands, and we played it. And it didn't look much. It was a, by this time, a white box with a very ordinary illustration on the box cover. But when you opened that box and played the game, it opened your imagination like no game had ever done before, and I don't think any game ever will again. The first role-playing game where you take on the role of heroes and wizards and fighters and clerics and go these fantastic journeys of the mind with your personalized character through experience leveling up over time is very, get very attached to that character. So, Steve and I were obsessed with D&D. Um, John was not at all, because he preferred the classic games. But we agreed that we should buy, buy some copies to sell through our full-color glossy magazine, Alan Weasel. <laughs> so we ordered six copies, because that's all the money we had in the world. And on the back of that huge order, we got an exclusive three-year distribution agreement for the whole of Europe. <laughs> Because Gary Gygax and uh, Brian Bloom, his business partner, and Kevin Bloom were also quite a fledgling business, so it were. And they thought it was great they got now a European distributor. <laughs> <laughs> but our distribution point was in this flat in Shepherd's Bush. <laughs> and it was funny because we started selling it through Owl and Weasel, and people, and we called the, game, the name of the company Games Workshop because. John had been making these board games all this time, and his, his, his bedroom was just full of sawdust and, and wood chippings. That's why we call it workshop and obviously games. And there were two people milling around on the, on the, on the street, Bolingbroke Road, and we were on the third floor. We used to say, want games workshop? Up here, mate. Come up here. We're up here. <laughs> it's not really a shop. And people would come up and see this mess, which is our flat, and still left happy. We didn't have a phone, obviously, no internet, no mobile phones. There was, a, there was a public phone on the ground floor which we shared with our Irish landlord on a Friday after he'd had a few beers. <laughs> he was not very particularly amused when the phone would ring, always going to be a telephone sale for Dungeons & Dragons. And we'd rush down the stairs, try and get there. Always oh, too late. <laughs> Paddy, hello. Hi, <laughs> ah, you want games? What's your dear? <laughs> you can go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> We call that public relations. <laughs> and it made people more determined than ever to try and find uh, where D&D &D was being sold. Anyway, we dedicated issue six of Alan and Weasel to D&D &D with now a 
green cover. And um, I think the circulation went up to 120. And we were very excited. And we started playing it, as I said. This is my very first dungeon. I still have it, a piece of it. And this is my very first character. I still have him. This is Anvar the Barbarian, now a pensioner. <laughs> Fighting an original Umber Hulk. Um, so, thank you. Sorry you can't be here today, but uh, I'm, I'm here in his stead. Um, we put out this really glossy professional catalogue with all the games that we're selling, and we used to start started running game days. The first one was in, in December 1975, and you can just about see maybe the, the writing that Dungeons & Dragons uh, was being played there. And Games Day was a very significant event for us in, in many ways, which I'll talk about in a few minutes if I, if I don't get hauled off the stage for speaking too long. Anyway, we were determined to um, do more with Workshop. So in, you go fast forward to 1976, John, Steve and I decided we want to go full time. We could just about eke out a living, not paying ourselves anything really. But um, John said he didn't want to join us on that journey. Um, he wants to carry on being his, his civil engineer, which was fine with him. So he left. Uh, we left the flat, uh, went to the States to meet Gary Gygax. We took nearly two months getting there. Um, we drove cars all over the place from New York to Los Angeles and back to Chicago and stuff. And we finally got to Gen Con, uh, Gen Con 9 on the 20th of August 1976. We looked like pretty bedraggled hippies, but it was fine. But we then told all the companies that we met that we were the UK agents for Dungeons and & Dragons and we should be uh, their agents too. And we signed up quite a lot of, of games. So this is where we first met Gary. This is a photo I took uh, in 1976 at, um, at um, Gen Con. And on the other side was Walt Buchanan um, from Diplomacy World. Um, we. In this photo, this is where we're looking at Steve's at the front smirking. Um, on this side, we've got Fritz Lieber, science fiction author. Next to him is Gary Gygax. Next to him is Professor Barker, who made a game called Empire of Petal Throne. That's me holding the boxes. And next to me is Rob Kuntz, um, who wrote a lot of the early D&D material. We also got to meet Miss Wisconsin 1976. <laughs> I don't know what she's doing today, but I'm enjoying myself here at the British Library. Um, <laughs> And so we left and came back to the state, from the States to the UK. And uh, this presented a slight problem at this point because we'd given up our flat, we didn't have an office, we'd sent all the boxes of the games we'd ordered to my girlfriend's flat because we, hadn't, we didn't have an address to send them to. Um, we go to the bank manager and say, well, we'll just get some finance and get an office, it'll be fine. So you go to a bank manager and say, hello, uh, we're from Games Workshop. We're the UK distributors of Dungeons & Dragons. It's a game which you play these fantastic um, journeys of the mind as characters, and it can go on for months, and you're a hero, a wizard, you kill monsters. And he, he looks at you a bit like a, a dog watching television. And uh, <laughs> the look of fear on his face, because um, what are these people talking about? And um, we were asked to leave quite quickly. But I guess now I realize, with hindsight, we were not exactly what you call investor ready. We didn't have any kind of investment memorandum, any cash flows or, or, or bank details to, to our name. So um, anyway, end result is Steve had a van. Van Morrison is a photo of it with Steve. <laughs> yeah. And that became our home for three months. Um, we joined a local squash club. Uh, for a shave and a shower, etc., in, in the mornings. And we set up shop at the back of an estate agent in a room which we called the bread bin. And here we are, 1976, in our tiny little office um, with, our, with our D and D. Um, and there it is in its glory there. It's um, tiny, but um, that's the bread bin games workshop in 76. We opened our first shop in 1978. I mean, this was a very big moment for us. I mean, we'd, we'd, we'd I've got this slides a bit out of whack here, and it should have shown White Dwarf before that. But um, we changed from Alan Weasel to, to White Dwarf in 1977 uh, to kind of up our game because TSR had Dragon magazine, and we needed to compete with, with, with Dragon in many ways. Uh, the, 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 the industry, although very fledgling, was beginning to professionalize in a way. 
So we opened our first shop in Hammersmith in, in, uh, in April 1978, and we were delighted to see uh, a rather large queue of people outside waiting to come in. I mean, kind of vindicated our belief in, in, in our hobby, although it was seen as being uber geeky at the time, we, we loved it. We were turning our hobby into a, into a business. Um, we also started Citadel Miniatures with Brian Ansel. Here's some of the very first miniatures in the original packaging. And as I said, we started White Dwarf magazine. Not sure why we had decapitation on the front cover of the first issue. <laughs> but um, there we are. And we were continuing to collaborate with, with, um, with, with Guy Gax and the Blooms on various projects. Perhaps the most famous one was the Fiend Folio. I suggested to Gary that as a follow-up to Monster Manual, we could do a job because we, were always, we had a column in White Dwarf called Fiend Factory, which is edited by Don Turbill, and I was still editing um, uh, White Dwarf at the time. So we put the whole thing together. Um, and then Gygax said that he wanted to merge the two companies. Um, we'd been, I said, exclusive to Supers for three years, the end of which he said, let's merge these two companies. Steve and I were independently minded Brits, and we said no to that merger opportunity. Um, we didn't want to spend half our life in Wisconsin, and we wanted to remain you know, completely independent. So by doing that, um, decided to TSR, not Gygax, who was a great friend, and was always going to be a friend to us. The company kind of wrote us out of the history. We didn't get any credits in, in Fiend Folio, although my name's listed as some of the, as one of the creators of some of the monsters, including the Hook Horror, um, which became a rather strange looking um, miniature figure for a large company. Anyway, that was, that was, that was the Fiend Folio. So we, we split our ways. Um, suddenly, Games Workshop was a little bit vulnerable. We're no longer the exclusive distributors. We remain the largest distributor because people were getting not just D&D &D from us, but all games from Games Designers Workshop, from Chaosium, Judges Guild, and all of the supplements and miniatures, etc., were coming from us. So we stayed very much in the business, but we needed to have our own thing. Um, and that's how, really how Warhammer came about. This is fast forwarded to Warhammer 40K, and I know we're not here to talk about that, it's another story, but just as a bit of a backdrop to how it happened, um, it was created by the guys at Citadel. It was originally Brian Ansell's idea. Sadly, he passed away the, uh, a couple of months ago. Um, it was gonna be a flyer in the, in, in, in the mail orders, but it gathered momentum as people got excited about it. He brought in two people, Rick Priestley and Richard Halliwell, to fresh out into a, a game, and that's how the first Warhammer came about. That evolved over time into Warhammer 40K, driven by Rick Priestley, and of course, Workshop um, became more known as Warhammer Outlets. Um, Steve and I sold out a workshop in 1991, some might say a little early. Now it's worth, <laughs> apparently, last check, three and a half billion pounds <laughs> on, the, on the London Stock Exchange. And unless, if I want to torture myself, I just say, let's just check out the share price of Games Workshop. <laughs> but um, it's great to have seen um, Workshop grow up and be so successful and still as relevant and as successful today as it ever was. Um, the business model really hasn't changed, selling own products in our own retail stores, uh, highly detailed models, created the Games Workshop experience, hiring people like ourselves, not traditional retailers, hiring people who love playing the games because their natural joy of playing was infectious and it created sales just because they were able to tell people how to play the rules, paint the figures, etc. So um, of course I'm delighted Workshop continued to go from strength to strength. But uh, going quickly back to to Games Day, I know I've probably overrun, but just I'll finish off in a second. It was through Games Day, um, through D&D, that, that Fighting Fantasy game books came about. Um, some of you might have known these books we wrote, Steve Jackson and I, first came out in 1982. Um, an editor from Penguin Books, Geraldine Cook, had seen the phenomenon of D&D being played, said, could we write a book about that hobby? And we said, well, let's write a book that allows you to experience that hobby. Uh, without really knowing what we were talking about. But um, she took our idea and ran with it and convinced Penguin management that this should be a good thing. 
And it kind of changed the course of history of, of, of in the UK publishing because these were the very first books in which you, the reader, were the hero. They were a branching narrative, but they also had a game system. It wasn't a just choose your own chapter kind of book. When you, when you encounter monsters, you roll dice. So giving the choice to readers was empowering. Got a whole generation of children reading. Um, this was Steve and I in 1982, uh, not long after the the first book launched, and of course, they were a very successful series um, and went on to sell you know, many millions. But linking that all together, there was also a kind of moral outcry at the time, as there was in the States, satanic panic, people thinking they're going to be taken over by the devil. And it certainly happened with ours. There was an eight-page warning guide published by the Evangelical Alliance saying if you were going to read Fighty Fancy Game books, you're, you're kind of bound to get possessed by the devil. I mean, there's no other, <laughs> no other way. It's going to happen. A, a worried housewife in deepest suburbia phoned her local radio station, said, having read one of my books, her child levitated. <laughs> <laughs> so the children are thinking, what, for £1.50 I can fly? <laughs> this was just fantastic publicity. The local vicar uh, near Penguin Books threatened to chain himself to the railings until they were banned. There were magazine articles saying children actually participate through their imaginations. God forbid you use your imagination. <laughs> it's poison. There were petitions sent in. These worried parents sent these petitions into Penguin Books saying they wanted the books banned because they're harmful for the kids. I have their addresses. <laughs> <laughs> But over time, they realized that actually these are quite good. The teacher was thinking, great for reluctant readers, short attention span, creative writing, critical thinking. And suddenly this empowerment through choice, which leads to achievement, was seen as a good thing that children can actually learn through reading these books. So it not only got children reading, but also empowered them to want to be creative themselves. So I take a lot of pride from that. So 20 million books, Friday Fantasy books have been sold. If you want to read more about it, there's Dice Man, Plug, 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 which is a personal memoir about the first 10 years of workshop, including fighting fantasy. But just to finish off, we were here to talk about Dungeons and Dragons and Gary Gygax in particular, who was a great friend of mine. And it's so sad that he passed away, um, so young, effectively. So I, and probably a large part of the tabletop industry, and particularly the video games industry, owe him and Dungeons and Dragons, a huge debt of gratitude. And uh, I dedicated Dice Man to him. So even though the last slide's gone, there he is. Um, that's the last time I saw him, was in Chicago in 1996. Um, he's a great man, so thank you. Follow that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was thinking that, I was thinking that. Um, so uh, I, I, am, I am very uh, embarrassed to be going after Surrey <laughs> after all of that because I'm just a little regular guy. I'm just a guy. Uh, I, had, I had about two hours to put this presentation together because I didn't know I was supposed to do one. So uh, it's a little rough around the edges, but I hope you'll bear with me. It's also, this is aimed more at, you know, I'm assuming everyone here in the room and maybe the people watching at home, you already know what D&D &D is um, and Dungeons and Dragons are. But if you don't, or even for the people in the future who are going to watch this, um, who don't really know too much about Dungeons and Dragons, um, this is a little bit of this is aimed, aimed uh, for all of you folks as well. So, uh, yeah, this is my very impromptu presentation. Um, so who's this guy? That's me. Uh, my history is I'm the Dungeon Master for High Rollers, which is a live Dungeons and Dragons show that goes out every Sunday. Um, we play for three hours and we stream the game. And my philosophy is we make it as authentic as possible. The game that you watch me and my pals play is very much like the kind of D&D game you can expect to play at home. We don't edit, we don't cut. We're just nerds, we're not actors, we're not you know, clever people. We make stupid jokes that make us laugh and nobody else. Uh, we fool around at the table, people put things in people's coffees, it's silly. Um, I've been playing for about 20 plus years um, and I've been GMing for High Rollers specifically for eight years, so we've been doing this for a while. So I've been told I know what I'm talking about uh, when it comes to this hobby, so they keep telling me. Um, I wanna make this a little bit more fun and interactive though. 
Um, so I've got a little thing because there's quite a few assumptions about D&D and expectations that have gone on through the years. So I've got just a couple of true or false questions. And I just want you guys to shout out the answer, whether you think it's true or false. Um, so the first one, if I've got it, D&D involves dressing up and running around woods <laughs> with swords and pretend to be elves and wizards. True or false? <laughs> Whoa. Uh, sometimes. Uh, I got a couple of choose. It is technically false. Uh, it is technically false. D&D uh, is a tabletop role-playing game. So most often we are playing it sat around a table. Um, some people might like to dress up. That's totally up to them. If them and their crew, are, uh, their, them and their group are fine with it, that's fine. But actually, the running around in the woods, dressing up in costume, is what we call LARPing, live-action role-playing. Um, all right, next one. D&D is a secret <laughs> occult practice that involves dark magic and devil worshiping. <laughs> Well, you might like to think it is, but it is technically false, I'm afraid. Um, Surian already touched a little bit on this. Uh, that, yeah, out in, and this was a real thing, especially out in the 80s in America, middle America, the satanic panic. This was a thing that was a genuine thing. That little comic that you saw there is part of a comic that was sent around to Christian groups and parents as a warning about the dangers of Dungeons and Dragons, that you were going to learn magic and summon devils and all, all of this kind of business. And in fact, here's a little bit of uh, knowledge for you. There is a movie with Tom Hanks called Mazes and Monsters, which is all about this phenomenon. It's a real movie and it is kind of that whole encapsulated thing. Um, it's a terrible watch these days, but if you want a, a piece of uh, little D&D history, you can check that out. Um, last one, D&D is only played by geeky white men. <laughs> there, we got it. Which I understand the irony of the three people on the stage right now. I understand that, but it is false, it is false. Um, no, and even going back into, you know, back into the 80s and things like that, people like to think that it was a specific demographic, but there were people all over the world who were enjoying this game. And today especially, D&D is an incredibly diverse group. My friends from the Three Black Halflings, you've got the wonderful ladies of Critical Role there as well. The group in, my group in High Rollers, we have 50% uh, women in that as well. Um, and it's also become a wonderfully inclusive place for queer and LGBTQ plus communities as well, because this is a place where you get to experience and kind of figure yourself self out and so it is not just the realm of the geeky white man anymore. Um, so what is D&D right? So D&D it's a tabletop role-playing game and really it is a process for you and your friends to get together have a little bit of a social evening um, you tell a story together you get to play a fantasy character uh, where the dungeon master creates a world narrates the you know events that are going on plays the monsters the merchants the townsfolk whoever it happens to be and you get to go on wacky adventures and then we use dice as a way of determining if certain outcomes are going to succeed or fail, right? Um, you might sometimes play with miniatures on a table. You might sometimes play just in your mind. These days, you can play online. If you've got a webcam and a microphone, you can play that way with digital tools as well. Um, let's do a little example of play here. Uh, so uh, I want you all... Uh, to imagine a sort of fantasy character, create a fantasy character in your mind. You might be, for example, say an elven wizard, a mage who has studied arcane magic and now you're going out into the world to see it for real and to, and to find and unlock some mysteries. You might be a dwarven warrior who wields her father's battle axe and is aiming to slay the goblin that killed all of her clan. You might be a human thief who likes thieving and stealing stuff. Um, that's fine too. Um, I want you to picture a character like this in your mind and then I, being the dungeon master, might narrate a scene to you and say, well, you come across on your way to the town of Briar Hill where adventure and opportunity await you. You come into an ancient woodland once believed to be home to the elves and you see an old stone bridge uh, engraved with all different runes and there is something strange and unfamiliar about this place and your senses are somewhat distorted. What what would you like to do? And then that becomes the ultimate question of the dungeon master, right? I would turn to all of you and say, what do you want to do? Anybody in the front row here got an idea? Let me get, uh, here we got a hand up. What would you, what would you do? I kind of roll. Okay, so you want to investigate magic in the area, right? You would like to use your skill as a mage. Use the skill of Arcana to determine if there's anything going on. 
great, I say, as the dungeon master, I ask you to make a roll, to roll a dice, to see what you might be able to glean about this place, what magic there might be in place it. You would roll a dice, a 20-sided dice. You would add a bonus that your character that you've created gets to have, uh, a numerical bonus based on your stats and the things that you've picked out the rule book. And then if your number beats a certain number that I, as the dungeon master, assign as a difficulty, you succeed. And I might tell you information that's hidden or secret. And if you fail, I might withhold information from you. And the process then repeats. Maybe you would learn that these runes are faded and no longer inert. Maybe you would learn that they're actually there to ward away trespasses. And if you try and cross the bridge without dispelling them, something terrible is going to happen. Really, this is the process of the game, right? And that's what D&D ultimately is. We are working together to tell a cool story, but using dice and rules as a way to navigate that and give us some form of structure. Um, I don't need to go into the origins of D&D because the lovely Sir Ian already beat me to it. Um, so, which is great because I had to write all this stuff down and now I don't need to remember any of it. But I did think it was great to kind of show this. We've got the wood grain box that Sir Ian mentioned. We've got the first, uh, the very first player's handbook up there as well. And then the classic red box, which I believe if I have my, my numbers around right, the red box was 1983, the basic set. And I think that's really the iconic one that a lot of people people remember, um, people that have seen in the past, and really what sparked off this huge phenomenon, especially in media and pop culture. Speaking of, in the last 10 years, um, certainly since I've begun my career as a air quotes, professional dungeon master, which is a wild thing I get to say these days. Um, D&D has really surged in popularity. And there's a number of reasons for this. Uh, fantasy as a genre has become a lot more popular and mainstream, thanks to shows like Game of Thrones. Um, these things really introduced fantasy as being something for everybody, not just the little nerds in the basement and people reading about hobbits and elves and things like that. It brought the idea of magic and myth and made it so that it could be about many different things. We also have shows like Stranger Things and Community, which showcase D&D to a wider audience, aside from some of those stereotypes um, that kind of painted it in a negative light. So this stuff has really kind of brought D&D and fantasy back into the mainstream kind of view set. You've also got this nerdy bunch of voice actors uh, to blame. Uh, this is the cast of Critical Role. Whilst they might not have been the first people to kind of televise or record their D&D games, they, I think we can all certainly agree that they definitely launched it to a level of fame unprecedented. They began streaming their game with Geek and Sundry over on Twitch, and it has now become an absolute phenomenon. They are receiving tens of thousands of viewers every week, and they even have an animated show on Amazon featuring their very first D&D campaign characters with the legends of Vox Machina. Um, Critical Role to this day is still known in pop culture and media around the world. Often when I'm explaining what I do, people go, oh, so it's like Critical Role then? Yes, it's like the awkward British version of Critical Role is what I do. <laughs> Um, we also now, to this day, have the power of YouTube and other technology. Back when I was learning to play D&D, you couldn't go on YouTube and figure out and say, how do I play D&D? How do I be a good dungeon master? These days, you've got creators like my good friends Ginny D and Matt Colville producing YouTube videos teaching you how to be a better dungeon master, fun ways to play characters, giving you tips on how to create combat encounters or just play the game. This is a new avenue that so many new players that I meet through what I do talk to me about and say it helped them get into the hobby of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, you also have digital tools now. D&D Beyond really changed the way a lot of people play. I know so many people now who refuse to play with a physical paper character sheet because D&D Beyond does it all for them. They don't need to do any maths anymore. And these tools really make it more accessible, especially for people with accessibility issues. Um, so these digital tools have made it even easier to play now as well. And then we also have D&D video games. Baldur's 
Gate has been around for a while, but Baldur's Gate 3 has won numerous awards. It has taken the video game world by storm. I remember speaking to streamers and video gamers who had never played role-playing games in their life, but they jumped into Baldur's Gate because it had such iconic characters and showed such a depth of player choice affecting the gameplay. And really, that's a huge part of what makes D&D so much fun and so, so popular. Um, it was mentioned in the intro, I had the opportunity to GM a game for the cast of Baldur's Gate, and I have never seen a group of people who were both so terrified and so excited at the same time. Uh, sitting down with their character sheets for the first time, I genuinely believe that uh, uh, Tim, who plays Gale, uh, nearly had a panic attack when I introduced him to spells for the first time. <laughs> Anybody here who's played a wizard in Dungeons and Dragons knows exactly what that feeling is like. Um, and that is it from me. Like I said, this was a very hastily put together presentation just to talk about what D&D is and what it is like today and why it's so popular and so beloved, um, especially of late, and how people have gotten into it. And I hope you've uh, enjoyed this. I'm Mark Humes. Like I said, you can check out High Rollers. We stream every Sunday, 5 p.m. here in the UK over on twitch.tv forward slash High Rollers d and and youtube.com uh, uh, High Rollers d and as well. And we're also just branching out into live events and in September, we will be at the Adelphi Theatre here in London doing a live D&D game on the West End, which is a whole other thing which is now a part of my career that I never thought I'd be able to say. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks for your time, everybody. Thank you very much. I feel, I feel mine was a lot less informative than Sirius. <laughs> that was great. It was great. Um, I want, so I wanted to start with a little bit of um, backstory, really. Um, so, Ian, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your childhood. And uh, that sounds honest, doesn't it? I mean, it does, yeah. So <laughs> you were at school with Steve yep. in Altrincham. Yep. What was distracting you from school? You didn't do brilliantly at school, did you, if you don't mind me saying? I did terribly at school, actually, yes. Um, <laughs> I, we, I mean, I came from an era when it was corporal punishment was the de rigueur in schools. So right. Uh, each teacher had their own weapon of choice. Um, so that's probably why I got into games, I suppose. <laughs> um, so I started playing um, a lot of Monopoly. Right. I played chess for the school, but Monopoly I was playing incessantly. I, I don't actually <coughs> like it so much as a game these days, but... Um, did you, and did your parents have Monopoly, or did you find it at school, or with friends, or...? I got it as a Christmas present. Right. But uh, I realised that games was... I just like the social uh, part of, of games. I mean, role-playing games, board games, that bring people together in a kind of shared common space. Right. And you can have, just have a fun. And the theatre on the fly, that's the thing about D&D, it's just created on the spot. So there's no preset scripts or anything. It's, right. It's there just to be enjoyed at that moment, and it spontaneous theat theatrical fun. Um, but there's a thing in Diceman that says that you never um, took the rent for uh, Whitechapel or Old oh, Kent yeah, Lane. Oh, yeah, yeah, This is me being a little smug little schoolboy. Um, <laughs> I played it so much that um, I used to wind my fellow players up. So if I own Whitechapel and Old Kent Road, the, the cheap properties, I'd just say, I'm not taking the rent. Just a, <laughs> that's chicken feed. I don't need that. <laughs> but unfortunately, that backfired because they decided to call me Feed after Chicken Feed. That was my nickname <laughs> at school, was Feed. Mm. And what, what about you, Mark? What was your... How did you start playing games? What was the first thing that you remember playing? Oh, I mean, I, I you know, uh, from a young age, like, you know, I was born into the era where, like, I remember a Game Boy being put in my hands as a young man, and that was, you know, the thing. But I, you know... For me, it was Games Workshop and Warhammer was kind of my introduction to a lot of stuff like that. And then from there, you know, the co older, cooler kids would be like, oh, yeah, we're playing D&D &D tonight. And you'd be like, oh, what's that? What's that? I want to know about that. Um, and then it was around sort of, I think we were 14, 15 um, in, uh, and uh, the third edition, Dungeons and Dragons, right. came out. And were you going to games? What, were you going to the shops then? Or? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We right. were in, my parents would dri drive into town. They'd be doing the weekly shop. And rather than having me annoying them the whole time, they'd drop me off in a games workshop and be, oh, just stay there for a few hours. We'll, we'll come pick you up in a minute and just leave me there in the care of adults that they didn't know. Um, <laughs> you know, I'd be like happily there painting Space Marines. But um, no, we, me and my friends, we had a little local game shop that was a comic shop. And we picked up a, the third edition of Dungeons and Dragons set. We ch uh, all chucked in our, our lunch money, our school right. money, and bought that. And that was like the start for us. But yeah. 
And was it clear to you that the social aspect of it was going to be important in the shops? Like, when was it obvious that they weren't just places where you're selling stuff? Well, I think I said in my talk that um, we didn't want to hire traditional retailers because they just didn't understand the games. Right. So we had to pe hire people who were like us, kind of deeply into the games. And therefore, it became this games workshop experience so people felt very comfortable coming into yeah. the shops. Mm -hmm. They were intimidated by thinking, this person's not going to know what I'm talking about if I ask for some, a certain supplement. So they could explain everything. And so people were just like, well, I'll just come around, hang out for a bit. Right. And, but it was great because it was totally infectious and everyone was, had this sort of common interest. And you felt a little bit, people felt they found somewhere special when they came into a, a workshop in the early days. And was, was it, in those early days, were there spaces for people to play or to paint or anything like that? Or? Well, it was quite cramped, I think. The shops <laughs> right. were quite small. Right. I mean, you know, the first office was literally a bread bin, but the first shop wasn't too big, but it was, we worked above that shop. I right. We worked on Saturdays, and we had some great fun when we were working in the shop on a Saturday. I write about in, in Dice Man. We used to import everybody's games, anything. we just stick it in the shelves and for the best, and we imported a game called Source of the Nile. Right. And uh, David Attenborough came in, Sir David Attenborough. He was looking at the shelves for quite some time. And he finally came and I said, can you tell me where Source of the Nile is? I said, I thought you might know where that is. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't laugh, of course. <laughs> he made me feel quite bad about that one. He did buy two copies, though. Oh, that's it, yeah. And did you play at Games Workshop? Did you carry on? I mean, you we used to play D&D like... &D upstairs, yeah. Right. Or we'd play on Saturday mornings if no customers came in, yeah. Right. Amazing. I was useless. I still am at painting miniatures. Absolutely <laughs> hopeless. And what was your split? Were you, was, did you start doing miniatures, or did you... Uh, were you Dungeon Master? Were you... Dungeon Master and player, right. yeah. yeah. And so how that did... That was my it... first dungeon on screen, and Anvar the Barbarian... And who were the, were the kind of uh, legendary players within Games Workshop? Were there? Yeah, we had uh, one of our first employees, Albie Fury, who did a lot of the production work. A phenomenal guy, sadly passed away. Um, he was a great storyteller. Like, I mean, Gygax was a fantastic raconteur. You know, yeah, he could hold an audience. And I'm sure you can too. Yeah, oh, you can. You he just sounds like he that. can, doesn't yeah, he? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, got the touch. and he had this sort of fantastic imagination, a way of. Of, of, of keeping people entertained, and that just was infectious. So you kind of lost your inhibitions. You just go into character and dip in and out of character, and just it's just amazing experience. Well, that's the wonderful thing with the storytelling. It's such an ancient art, really, isn't it? It all ties back to that same thing of the way that you tell the story and involve the people who are listening and get them to contribute. It's such a beautiful kind mm. of classic, you know, part of the human experience, isn't it? That storytelling. When did you realise you could do it, Mark? When did you realise that? Well, I've I've always been a theatre kid. You know, my right. my parents were like amateur dramatics people, and my dad's a big presenter. You know, he used to do comedy clubs and would go up and do stand up and things like that. And uh, from I mean, my one of my earliest memories is being like the Ugly Duckling in like the Panto, the week, you know, the local Panto and things like that. Right. And as soon as my one line had the whole audience in hysterics and things like that because of the delivery. And I think it's always just been a part of me. So I trained as a theatre kid and everything like that. And like I was always the the face of my mates, you know, if we were the A-team, you've got the big bruiser, my mate Harry, who was the big guy, and then I'd be the face who was, like, doing all the wheeling and dealing and charming and things like that. So I think I always kind of kept that natural spin to it all. The charisma. I've got a, I've got a good natural charisma, I think. <laughs> 18, 16, um, um, 15. <laughs> and was the initial split between you and Steve, he was looking after the books, and you were going out there doing the selling? What was the... How did that pan out? No, we did everything together. Right. I mean, but I specialised more on production than he right. specialised more on admin, but it wasn't any kind of specific role. So we were, I mean, we were making it up as we went along. Right. You know, there was no industry as such. And um, I guess if we'd started today, we might have failed, but at least there was no competition. So right. we were able to fail and not go out of business. Uh, but just doing White Dwarf on its own must have taken up... Oh, yeah, because, I mean... It was awful because it was, there was obviously no computers to help you right. create it. So everything had to be typewritten, and then you take that typewritten stuff off to the typesetters who bring it back in sheets of typewritten stuff, which then paste down on a handmade light box that we did. And there's this stuff you have to glue it on, we're called cow gum. It's kind of, kind of like 
petrochemical stuff. <laughs> that kind of you end up dizzying around like you have some nice stuff. <laughs> A day I'm doing Calgum, doing White Dwarf, we go home and think, where am I? <laughs> and um, so I used to do some of the writing under a pseudonym and right. do everything together to put out White Dwarf because mm. we couldn't really afford the, uh, the overhead of employees much at that and time. Was it distributed beyond comic shops? Was it distributed it wasn't, beyond It was games? only in a couple of comic shops, Forbidden right. Planet, um, or Titan Books as it was at the time, uh, but mainly in game shops. Right. And the reason why we opened our first Games Workshop retail shop in 1978, because we'd been selling it into other shops, but a lot of them just couldn't get their heads around that it wasn't just a box that they could stock on the shelf and hope for the best. Right. That it needs supplements and knowledge and paints and miniatures and all that stuff, and they just couldn't be bothered with it. Right. So we said, well, we might as well open a flagship store ourselves, and that's how, um, wow. how it came about. Because as the breadroom was at the back of the state agents, and they'd fed up with us, all these parcels arriving all the time. So they said, you're going to have to leave. They said, well, you're a stage agent. Finds the shop. So they found the one in, in, Dalling, in Dalling Road. And we were vindicated that all those people were there. And did you, do you know any of those people in that photograph? Well, um, I've tried to reach out right. on a few occasions to try and do a kind of you know, reunion shot at right. some point. Maybe a bit difficult now because it's now flats. But... Um, <laughs> Um, I met the first person in the queue, queue Oliver MacDonald. So I've got four of the two hundred, no I think. Wow, wow. Well, that's cool. amazing. And was it? Did you have any indication that there was going to be a queue there? Was that a surprise? Oh my God, it's going to work. We obviously advertised it in White Dwarf, um, and we advertised that we were selling D and D for the first six copies for like fifty p or something. Right. So that clearly worked well. <laughs> and what was it, rewinding a bit? Who do you think was the first person to play it in the UK? Or who was the first person? The to first play people it? we knew was um, was at City Games Club, right, City the University, University. University. Um, Andrew Holt and Stephen Higgs, if right. I recall the names. And we saw it being played and thought, "What's that?" Because <laughs> we were there to play you know, Avalon Hill games and SPI games, that were right. war games that we were playing ourselves. And then we, we said, oh, I want a piece of that. <laughs> oh, and when did you realise that people were going to listen to, watch, that it was going to work, what you were doing? Well, you know, we... You had an audience. The very... The way High Rollers started was we were given, like, a slot on a streaming schedule on a Sunday that nobody else wanted. And it was... None of us were, like, pretty... You know, a few of us kind of had little YouTube things that we were doing at the time. But we honestly thought nobody was going to watch it. We thought, like, oh, we'll get, like, a few hundred people and then in two months' time that'll be it. Like, nobody will care. And we just kept watching people watch it. And honestly, for the first six months, I still couldn't believe that people were doing it, you know. I was just like, why, why are people tuning in? Like, you know, blah, blah, blah. But um, I think, like, seeing what, like, guys like the Critical Role guys were doing and Penny Arcade that were doing Acquisitions Incorporated and things like that as well, there clearly was a, an audience for it. I just didn't expect anybody to want to me to do it. Right. Um, but, no, it was... Uh, yeah, like I think that there was definitely a, a, a surprise at how much people engaged with it, even when they couldn't play it, when they could just watch other people right. play it, right? And that's created like a real uh, interesting dynamic. And did you people. watch people play it when you were younger? What, d and Yeah, I mean, was, there, was that element of enjoying other people watch it, or was it just that you always participated? Well, there, was no, there was no streaming of it at that time. <laughs> It'd be quite, you'd so, have to just awkwardly perch over their shoulder, right? It's That's a lean it. over. Yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> You're doing it wrong. Plonked a miniature figure. Around. Yeah. So I didn't watch much. I, I prefer to play, to be honest. And I like creating and I like playing. I'm not much of a watcher, particularly. Because right. I remember watching people play video games when I was younger. Yeah. There was, there well, was... Of course, with esports as well, watching. Yeah. 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 And what did, when did you, leaping forward a little bit before we go on to questions, what. Um, the interest, one of the interesting things about D&D, one of the things that makes it so extraordinary is the sort of unravelling of the storytelling process, the way that it um, yeah. uh, reconstructs it. Um, it's completely different to mediums before it. When did you suddenly think, oh, there's something here going on with video games, I can see some kind of connection in the way that stories are made and reshaped there? Because you obviously went on to a career in video games. Yeah, I went on to a yeah, quite a Serious video game Relatively career, significant. but there's a, obviously there's a there's a big difference between the two. Yeah, one is basically a, based on the imagination, and video games is versus everyone sees the same imagery. Yeah, 
And the power of the imagination is always, I think, greater than the, no matter how amazing some of the graphics look. I think it's nice to let your imagination run wild. I mean, Gygax famously said that he prefers radio to television because the pictures are better. <laughs> <laughs> Very good line. I, I, can I ask a question, Sir Ian? Yeah, go on. <laughs> when you were playing back then in those days, did people do things like voices for their characters and things like that? Because that's like a no! thing I love to do. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> that's something I love to do. But I, I always wonder, like, going back to then, was it just as it is today? Were people doing funny voices and things like that? After a day of cow gum, yes. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> hello, my name is Tim the Mushroom Man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, of course. It's... Oh, amazing. I love it. That's, I love to know that. Yeah, you just let your inhibitions go. And exactly. Just go yeah. for it. Yeah, I love that. Love that. What else, Mark? Ask him a couple more about the No, that's the only one I've got. That's the only one I wanted to know. Everything else, I'm good. We had lovely chat back in the green room. <laughs> what, um, when was the last time you played it? Uh, probably about four or five years ago. Right. I did a thing for something or other. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> did a thing <laughs> TV, somewhere. It's a TV thing. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's the commitment of getting people together right. is, is a problem we get to kind of my age. But... We do play ball games every week, the same group. I'm still playing with Steve Jackson and three other friends. Right. I'm secretary of the Games Night Club. It's been running <laughs> since 1986. I've done 647 newsletters, the Games Night newsletter, to a circulation of five subscribers. Whoa. <laughs> and we have a trophy. We keep a record of every game played every week. And the points at the end of the year, we have this cup in the presentation. Oh, my God. I am amazing. the current holder. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that sounds like a good, a good moment for us to ask some questions. Um, there's a person down here, and then there's a person over there, and then we'll probably take one online. So the microphone's going to come down. Um, we just need to use the microphone so the people online can hear. There's a microphone just tip-tapping down the steps. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hello, Sir Ian Livingston. Um, first, I just want to express my great appreciation considering the opportunity. Um, my question specifically concerns um, my fascination within the dichotomy between fantasy and information and how games specifically can create an educational media format to transfer knowledge from one mind to another. Um, with your experience within areas such as ludology and pedagogy, what do you think is unique about fantasy and specifically games as interactive storytelling media and its role within the future of education and technology? Great well, question. Amazing question. Thank you. Uh, I've always been a great believer in the power of play, um, how obviously games entertain you, but people don't always talk about what's good about playing games. And if you can pro park your prejudice in terms of video games, against one or two titles that children shouldn't be playing anyway, but they are 18 rated by the way, so they shouldn't be playing them, and just think cognitively what's happening when you're playing a game. Um, they're, you're problem solving. You're not watching something wash over you. You're having to use your brain to get through the game. Um, you learn intuitively. You can fail in a safe environment. You're not punished for making a mistake like you are in an examination. Games like Minecraft and clearly Dungeons and Dragons, they are very creative. Uh, and Minecraft, um, a child can learn by applying the heat of a furnace to silica sand. They can make glass. And they take that glass and put it in their environment and create these effectively digital Lego, these wonderful 3D architectural worlds, and share them with their friends because it's bringing people together through games. And I think that kind of participation leads to achievements. And people don't understand the value of games from that point of view. Societies always kind of judge games in a kind of negative sense. I mean, the satanic panic happened with fighting fantasy game books, happened with D&D. &D. It happens with video games, but I think games are a great force for good. And the, the creativity, the critical thinking, the problem solving, the community aspects, whether it's tabletop games, role-playing games, video games, is a great thing. And when we enter this world as babies, we interact, we learn through play. And we should never stop playing. And for me, life is a game and never going to stop. Thank you. 
So there's a person down there, two more, um, two rows down front row, two in. There we go. Uh, yeah, hi, I was, yeah, uh, thank you, by the way, awesome. Um, yeah, this question, uh, I actually heard it this morning on Triforce podcast, so thank you, Lewis and Perrin. Um, and you mentioned how big of an impact do you think has automatic calculation of mechanics, like D&D Beyond, calculators, everything, um, the internet made on people or players in D&D choosing harder classes in that aspect, like wizards, mm. or especially going on with a longer campaign because spells will become more complicated, mechanics mm. more compli complicated. Do you think that's improved or increased the amount of like either longer campaigns or those roles being chosen? Yeah. Okay. Classes. Um, yeah, I think a great question as well. I think that digital tools have been a wonderful addition to games like D&D &D and other tabletop role-playing games. You know, more and more games and companies are starting to incorporate digital tools now. You have a company like Demiplane that's doing it for lots of different games like Pathfinder and Vampire the Masquerade and um, upcoming Daggerheart and things like that as well. And I think that the it, it's a double-edged sword because in some ways, and I see this with my own players, um, it's very easy when you use these digital tools that kind of do everything for you to forget how the sausage is made. So it's like, oh, how does this ability work again? Oh, I don't know, the game just says it does this, but they don't know why it does that. On the reverse side, it's exactly what you said. It makes classes like a wizard or a sorcerer or things that have traditionally been a little bit quite complex versus, say, a barbarian or a fighter, which is a little bit easier, um, much more manageable because now you have tick boxes. I have this many spells left. I cast this, it does this. It reminds me what it does. I can click the button. It does it all automatically. So I think it's very much like accessibility tools. You know, I'm somebody who can go back and use a paper character sheet, and I know how everything is made, and I try and instruct my players to understand how their abilities work and why they work that way. Um, with the fifth edition of D&D, like making sure they know that their proficiency bonus, you know, when that goes up, it increases everything. Because um, when they can't use those tools, they need them. On the other side, I have players who I know myself as well, are a little bit dyslexic and sometimes it's easy to misread numbers or forget damage and things like that. So it's a great, great tool for that. And I think it's like a lot of technology, it's something to embrace, but be aware that there are cons and things as well. Um, so yeah, but yeah, that's, that's my view on it kind of thing. Hope that, hope that answers it. <laughs> I'm gonna go right to the back. There's a person with, I'm gonna say green, but it could be blue. <laughs> It's green. It's a it's greeny blue. blue. A greeny blue. It's, yeah, it's you. It's you. It's, yeah. And there's a microphone. Thank you. Um, I think it's puce, maybe. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, it's a great honour to, uh, um, to be in front of Sir Ian um, and hear him, hear him speak. Um, been a big fan for a long term, a uh, long time. What I would specifically like to uh, uh, to ask you is about Anvar the Barbarian. Do do you have any particular anecdote, something very memorable, uh, your favourite dungeon, your your favourite adventure, something that uh, exciting happened to the character that may bring him back out of retirement? Well, he he was um, he was. I think, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, a terrible person to be around. <laughs> <laughs> totally unpredictable, likely to do strange things, get everybody into trouble, and probably double cross you. So, uh, slightly anarchic, a little bit chaotic, um, friends of everyone. Big monster comes along. I'm chaotic evil. Oh, guess what? I'm chaotic evil too. And, uh, <laughs> And um, we'll kill the rest of the gang. And that, as long as it was, it was about just self-preservation. Wow. Um, but he survived. <laughs> <laughs> Not an easy feat back in those days as well. Not an easy feat at all. Well, Steve, you know, his character, Crew, gone. <laughs> <laughs> Son of Crew did better. I love it. Love it. Have we got any online questions? Yes. Yes, there. Great. Hi, thank you. Um, I'll try and wrap a couple of them up together. Um, these are questions for uh, Sir Ian. Is there anything that you change about Dungeons & Dragons? And if so, what would you change? And perhaps an interrelated question. Is there anything Sir Ian would change if he had to do it all over again? Regrets. 
<laughs> yeah, I definitely claim there's rents on Whitechapel on camera. <laughs> um, and it's not for me to say how D and D should change. I mean, it's a glorious set of rules, highly unintelligible in the early days, but <laughs> it was basically an excuse to have a lot of fun of storytelling with like-minded people having a great time, and the rules were there to be referred to as and when required. So you could play as deep as you want, or as serious as you want, or as light as you want. We were always on the, the light side. Um, it's a bit like people say, they always cheat when they used to go through my fighting fantasy game books, but that's okay. As long as you're enjoying yourself, that's fine. So it's, I wouldn't want to change anything. I think I haven't played the latest rule set, but everyone says it's, they're amazing, and I'm sure you're gonna tell me they are as well. <laughs> no, it's good. It is good. It is good. I like simplicity, especially when you get older. Progress is all about keeping things simple, not getting them complex. So as long as they're accessible and easy to understand and, and great for everybody to enjoy themselves without being intimidated, that's what I think should happen in, in, in all games. I'm not, not one for spreadsheet manager. <laughs> no. Can we see some more hands? I'm just going to look around the room. Can we have in the middle with uh, white? We could go for white, couldn't we? Rather attractive jumper. Pass the mic along. Um, I guess my question is for both of you. Um, and Sarian has almost answered it in, in, his, in his last response which is that obviously Dungeons & Dragons has changed so much since it was first created. Um, so do you have a favourite edition or rule set? And if so, why? Because it became so much more complex and then recently so much simpler mm. again. I feel like we've got the two halves of the edition <laughs> sort of expansion covered. Yeah. So, Well, for me, it's the first edition because... Um, and they were largely unintelligible. You had to make up most of it yourself. But it's what, the, what you, when you start on something and then that becomes yours and everything else becomes a, a variant, which is never going to be as good in your own mind. But, um, yeah, the, f the first one. I've still got a, a white box shrink wrapped at home as well. which I Very jealous. But I can't bring myself to open it to no. look inside the rules again. <laughs> yeah, off. keep it pristine. Um, I think for me it is... Uh, uh, I, I think I would have to say the most recent edition, 5th edition, is the edition I certainly know the best, and it's been a big part of my career. But I have a very strong soft uh, spot in my heart for the 4th edition of D&D, &D, which is very controversial. A lot, I, I, a lot of people, ooh. Um, I was very lucky that my group, that when we played it, I was the DM, and uh, we managed to still keep all of the role-playing, all of the story stuff in it. But I actually think it was vastly ahead of its time in some of its mechanical design. Um, it had some really clever ways of making it so accessible to people um, and understandable and some really fun gameplay mechanics that I I still use to this day minions and um, action points and, and things like that and you know more reactionary abilities and things like that um, which I find really really fun but uh, I know that's quite a quite a spicy take to say but no I think that the fifth edition rule set because it does strike that balance of it has some of that simplicity from the earlier editions but with a lot of modern sensibilities and modern games design uh, involved into it as well. Um, and I think it's very playable, and I think its popularity shows how easy it is to learn and to pick up as well. Can we, and can we just have a, a shouting poll, if that's a thing? What would be everyone's preferred edition? <laughs> what do we think that was, second and fifth? Yeah, second and fifth, it sounded like. Those are the ones I heard. First. <laughs> I think it's possibly a single voice there for first. Any edition that doesn't have Thacko in it, I'm quite okay with. So. <laughs> yeah. And what about the question? Or who, what, what was, what's your preferred edition? Third. Third. That was my, that was my starting one. Favourite monster? So Ooh. we'll go down the middle. That's the question of it. We'll go to the... <laughs> Favourite monster? We'll devils. It's down, always devils for me. Down to the scheming. front on the right... Uh, third row in, yep, you, and then we'll go back four, and then we'll go across one. It's like playing a chess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Rook to east yes. four. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank 
you both, Sir Ian and Mr Humes, for your time and presentations. Um, I just want to ask whether you prefer being a dungeon master or a player, because oh, um, I'm, I, I'm kind of getting into it a bit, and I'm not sure whether I kind of want to kind of take on the responsibility mm -hmm. of being a dungeon master. Oh, amazing. Oh, amazing. Good amazing. question. Yeah, great question. Great question. Well, it's a lot easier to be a player because you don't have to do any work. You just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't I know it? <laughs> so you can just enjoy yourself. Um, my bit of being a dungeon master, I really enjoy because I love luring people to people's deaths. And, uh, <laughs> and I mean, that's, I carry uh -huh. that on with Fighting Fantasy game books, so making sure people have made the wrong choice, uh, promising them everything, of course. Spikes with dragons awaited them. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's fun, fun being both. I like the creative element of being a dungeon master, but I love the joy of play too. So, mm. it's hard to make an absolute choice. I'm a, I'm a very different dungeon master, Serian. I, I, I am very much, I don't want the players to die. <laughs> I'm, I'm too nice quite often. Um, I, I would say that uh, I am what we jokingly in, in, the, uh, in the community call a forever dungeon master. And that is if you start being a dungeon master for your friends, they won't ever let you be a player. <laughs> Um, but that's, you know, I, you know, then you get a bit older and somebody else is like, hey, I'm thinking of running D&D. And you're like, yes, I'd be a player. Yep, yep, absolutely. <laughs> um, but no, I think being a dungeon master is an incredibly creatively rewarding thing. If you want to give it a go and you've got a cool idea for a story or a campaign, absolutely try being a dungeon master because there's a lot less of us. You know, we need more DMs in the world. So if, you, if you're ready to give it a go, I say go for it. Great stuff. Good advice. So we're going four back to there, and then we're going one across there. Hello. Thank you very much. I wanted to know what is the weirdest idea for a character you've ever had or that have seen someone else play? Oh. <laughs> weirdest character. Um, I've got one, if you want to... If you, if you yeah, you, well, I'll make one up. You, wait, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. The D&D the experience. Um, <laughs> So I had a character, it was only for a one-shot once, but uh, I played a kobold um, paladin, uh, and I used a, it was in fifth edition, and I used a subclass of paladin that I had made called the Oath of Love, which was basically Sailor Moon as a paladin. <laughs> and the kobold, when he would transform, would become this gorgeous, kind of bishonen, pretty, handsome, young human knight. And then he was a kobold in his normal form. Um, and so, uh, but in both forms, he, he taught like this, hello, yes, very good. Um, in both forms. Uh, so <laughs> that, that was probably the strangest character I've played. My strangest one, and I only did it for like one evening, was playing a rust monster. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> Just, just a straight up rust monster. I love it. <laughs> Nothing else to it. I love it. <laughs> Didn't have many friends. Did he have a name? <laughs> Rusty. Rusty. <laughs> Very good. Perfect. You'd mentioned game books. If Dungeons and Dragons brought back their Forever Quest game books, would you both like to write for them? Would I like to write for Forever Quest? Uh, briefly, no. <laughs> because I'd be competing with myself. It <laughs> sounds a bit pointless, really. <laughs> so I'll carry on writing fighting fancy game books, I think. Yeah. Done. <laughs> what about you? No? Uh, this is where I'm going to be embarrassed and say I don't know what a Forever Quest book is. I, I am too young to know. Um, but I would certainly love to write more stuff. I will say that. I love writing adventures and I love writing uh, modules. So, Could we go to the middle over there? Yeah, to the person with the right hand up and then one behind and then down to the front. And if I'm missing anyone out, just Only about it. 20. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get to you. This is why I don't like being the panel host, because then I don't feel guilty for not <laughs> picking on some people. Hi, yes. Um, so I have a, a, a question for um, us ladies and other minorities. 
uh, in your uh, career, I guess, for both of you, have you seen an increase in gender diversity and also just ethnic diversity as well? And if so, um, in what shape, form, and when? Well, from, from my point of view, our very first employee was mixed race um, at Games Workshop. So we saw that from first hand. We tried to make our particular D&D sessions and Games Workshop experience as inclusive as possible in times that weren't that inclusive. Um, but you can't force these issues. They have to happen naturally. I don't think you should get angry because we're all trying to be as inclusive as possible, but things take time. Yeah. And I think you have to be patient for this. And in, in time, I think everything will be in the place it should be. But we, we tried our best, for sure. And especially in games. I mean, when I moved into video games, I, mean, I launched um, as chairman of IDOS Lara Croft Tomb Raider. Now, there are some people who were concerned at the time, and it was the 90s, by the way, of her physical shape at the time. At the same time, she was a strong, independent, intelligent adventurous who was able to explore and be powerful at a time when the other influences at the time were like Nana Cherry and Tank Girl and, and Girl Power was starting. And nearly 50% of players, or at least watching, were females, and it became effectively a role model. Now, clearly, in these days, her physical form has changed inside the game and is more realistic. But she, it was a strong, powerful character. And I think the games industry was started by males making content primarily for males. As you saw, the queue outside of Games Workshop, people comment about that was all young, white uh, males. But those are the people who wanted, were interested in that at that time. You can't look back at history and say it was wrong. It was what it was. But now we're, everyone's become more aware and doing the right thing. And long may that continue. Yeah. And for me, you know, my perspective in the industry is as a creator, you know, I don't run a company that employs lots of people, but I see the industry in the last 10 years. And, you know, I mentioned that for high rollers, you know, we've got Kim, Katie, Rhiannon, um, you know, Kim is, is Malaysian. Um, and even myself, my own sort of gender identity I've explored over the last couple of years, which those who follow me online have, have seen some of that journey. Um, but also, I have seen it massively increase in diversity since I started playing. You know, back when I go back 20 years when I was playing in high school, yeah, it was all me and my, you know, white single male friends. But now, you know, you've got my friends in Three Bike Halflings. I've GM'd for people of all colors and creeds. Um, women are so much more involved in the hobby, not just in D&D, &D, but in tabletop in general. They're writing it, they're producing it, they're creating their own books, their own systems. I know so many incredible creators of color, um, women, and on, on uh, the queer spectrum as well, who produce solo TTRPGs, who have worked on some of the biggest books in TTRPGs. Um, you look at things like creators, like on TikTok and YouTube and, Twi and Twitch, and so much more diverse than it used to be. Still, progress can be made, absolutely, and I, I certainly champion for a lot of the, uh, for diverse casts to be more visible. Um, and it's why I, I, you know, I'm a big fan of you know, supporting you know, creators uh, you know, uh, and making sure that they get seen. Because I think that there can still be a little bit of a bias uh, to you know, the, the white male GM, like myself. Um, and it's great to see that that is changing in the industry, both professionally and from a community standpoint. Um, and I think that it has changed. Still a way to go, but it's changing, and I think it's changed so much for the better. OK, we're going one back. Yeah, so first of all, thank you, thank you both for the, uh, the talk in the evening today. And uh, second of all, my, my question was for Sir Ian, and it, it was really about the, the backlash during the 80s. And obviously, it's, it's easy to look back at it and, and laugh because it was pretty ridiculous. But I suppose, first of all, what, it, what was it like dealing with it at the time? And, and second, how did you sort of stick to your guns and kind of ignore the, the pressure you were getting from outside? 
Well, I think, uh, as I said, in a strange way, it acted in, in our favor because people have thought the criticism was crazy, plus it was about the only publicity we were getting. Um, because pe pe the media wasn't really interested in writing anything positive about games then. I mean, it's more, much more socially acceptable today. Games are almost in danger of becoming socially acceptable, which is great, but back then it, it wasn't. Therefore, but, but there's no such thing as bad publicity, as they say, so it was actually acting in our favor. But some things were terrible. One incident I should relate to is, uh, again, uh, is talk about it in Dicemen, that we used to import a lot of games as well as Dungeons & Dragons from all sorts of American companies. And it wasn't long after the Falklands War in 1983. We used to represent uh, a company. Uh, I think it was Mayfair Games at the time, was it? to remember. And they all sent us one sample of a game, whatever it was, and they sent us a sample of a game that they called War in the Falklands. And the war hadn't been over very long, and clearly it was a very sensitive subject, a tragic war and tragic loss of life uh, during that war. So we said no. In most historical games, you need like 100 years, something before, or 50 years at least, before you start making a game about it to simulate the events. So we said no, we, we're not going to import any copies. Meanwhile, there were some people wanted it, and gray copies were being imported, gray imports from, from into various shops, and people were able to buy it, but not through us. So we got a, a call from a major Sunday newspaper, are you Games Workshop? Yes. Um, do you have War in the Falklands? Yes, we've got one sample copy. Thank you very much, goodbye. Next day, the Sunday newspaper had a front page with a photo of the game, uh, HMS Sheffield as a counter, Games Workshop, uh, importers of War of the Falklands. We had one copy. And the result was we had phone calls. No one wanted to answer the phone. Our receptionist was terrified. A commando, ex-commando phoned up, said he was going to come and firebomb our warehouse. And it was quite a worrying time. So the power of the media is, is quite scary sometimes, the effects without knowing what they're doing to people by taking a story and running with it even though it wasn't true the, at all. And the, some of the stuff that I've written about games in the past is madness. But the satanic panic at the time was bizarre. <laughs> but it was so bizarre that everyone thought, I want some of this. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to go down to the front and then we're going to have a few questions from our online audience. Hello. Firstly, thank you very much because I haven't been able to stop smiling all evening. Thanks to you guys. Um, my question is for both Mark and Sir Ian. As creators, uh, both of you have gone through a big journey, and I'm guessing that there's been moments where it's been difficult, and there's been moments where you've thought, is this going to succeed? Am I going, like, you've doubted yourself, I'm guessing, at some points, but there have been those uplifting moments that have made you feel warm inside, and have made you think, do you know what, it's worth it, and, and it's all amazing. Could you please share a few of those moments that have made you feel like it's all worth it and like you're doing the right thing? Oh, John, go, go first. Go first, yeah. Um, I think that there are, uh, there are sort of two that really sh come to mind initially, um, and that is that we had not been doing high rollers very long when Wizards of the Coast reached out to us and they invited us to Seattle for the very first D&D Live. And this was a big live event that Wizards of the Coast had done for the first time. They invited D&D creators from all over the world, from Australia, we had Dragon Friends, there was us from the UK, there was Critical Role there, Penny Arcade, uh, Girls Guts Glory, so many like people, all these different creators. And they brought us all together for a weekend of streamed games to promote the Tomb of Annihilation uh, module. And it was an incredible experience because there we were, you know, I was there meeting Jerry Holkins of Penny Arcade, who I had admired for a long time. I was hanging out with Matt, who's been my friend for 20 years. He's like a big brother to me. I met Chris Parkins. I met all these amazing people that I had admired. And we were treated as, as these kind of 
kind of start, you know, it was like, oh my God, it's you. They were ex excited to meet us as we were excited to meet them. And it really cemented that we had something very special and that we could stand shoulder to shoulder with some of these titans, you know. Um, and that made me, me, made me very, very proud. Um, and then I think the, the other one was uh, we did um, very, actually two very quick ones if I can take the moment. Uh, one was we did a fundraiser for building our own studio. And we thought we would maybe raise 10,000 pounds. We thought, man, if we can hit 10,000 pounds, that'd be amazing. Uh, we raised 40,000 pounds. And I remember being very overwhelmed and like emotional at that. Um, and we had the same experience when we ended our very first stream campaign, Lightfall, uh, where the, we finished the campaign. It was the end of it, you know, wrapped everything up and we were reading donations and they just wouldn't stop coming in and coming in and coming in. And the running total was getting higher and higher of people just saying, thank you so much, we love the, and the messages that people were sending. And it reached the point where I had to take my microphone off and leave because I could feel myself about to burst into tears just from happiness and joy, because I'm a very, I'm a crier. Uh, and so I went out the room and came back and I was like snotting everywhere. I was like, no, I'm fine, guys, I'm fine. I'm just doing all of that. And that, that really stuck with me. And again, that just showed me how much impact we'd had on other people, how much they'd enjoyed our silly little D&D game that we just put on the internet. So yeah, that was it for me. Um, when you're li living in the back of a dilapidated Bedford van in Shepherd's <laughs> Bush in winter and it's raining hard, you begin to wonder, are there any going to be any upsides to this story? But when you're effectively living the dream, because we turned our hobby into a business, it was still great fun. But the big moments, I think, were several. Um, first issue of White Dwarf. First day opening of the Rooster Hill store, Games Workshop, opening, um, meeting Gary Gygax in those early days, of course, big moment, Gen Con 76. Um, and seeing our first Final Fantasy game book, The Warlock of Firetop Mountain, on the shelves in WH Smith was a fantastic moment. And years later, today, you know, they're, they're still in print. I'm very proud of that. I've got a new one coming out in September. The, uh, the Dungeon on Blood Island, the sequel to Death Trap Dungeon, but meeting so many people who say Fighting Fantasy changed their lives in a positive sense that got them reading and made them the people they are today and gave them a kind of strength when times were sometimes tough for people back then, that being able to be these heroic characters inside our books was really, really very, very gratifying and encouraged, say, creative writing and people taking up uh, positions in the creative industry. So, there's been so many things, but the games industry uh, is such a fantastic industry. It doesn't have the celebrity like film and, and TV and music, and very people are very grounded. They're very collaborative. They help each other. And you know, I'm, you know, I'm obviously I'm ancient. I'm 74 now, but I'm never going to retire. I'm going to always carry on going to conventions, meeting people, writing, playing. It's just been an absolute joy. Thanks. So we've got some questions from our online audience. Um, yeah, thank you. This, this question sort of leads on from what you were saying, um, Sir Ian. Um, fighting fantasy changed my childhood. I'm now 52, but lived with undiagnosed ADHD for many years. And I think fighting fantasy was a hugely successful channel for me in my imagination. Can you relay some of your favorite characters and scenarios in the fighting fantasy books? I have a few, but I'd love to know the ones that you were most excited by and most proud of. Uh, well, by the characters, I presume the ones, the non-player characters that the red reader met on their journey. <laughs> Sadly, most of them died. And uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, in Island of the Lizard King, Mungo, uh, he died off pretty quickly in, uh, in, the, in the claws of a giant crab. And people keep saying, where's Mungo? Um, he's, he's dead on Fire Island. <laughs> he's dead, and, baby. Um, perhaps the most famous one is Throm the Barbarian. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Throm. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, you meet him and you have to befriend him and together you go through Death Trap and you need his help. But there comes a point where there's only one person allowed to get through Death Trap Dungeon. So you're obliged to fight him and a lot of that upset quite a lot of young readers at the time. 
And people also thought he wore sunglasses looking at Ian McKay's amazing illustration. It was actually an eye patch if you look closely. <laughs> but we had the pleasure to work with some amazing artists at, at, at Fighting Fancy. And I think those guys and girls should be given more plaudits for the great atmosphere they created through their illustrations. Ian McKay, who did four of my covers, Death Up Dungeon, uh, with the Blood Beast on the front, one of my favorite characters. Uh, Zambar Bone on the cover of Citadel, of uh, Citadel, that's Steve's book, City of, uh, City of Thieves, um, with the spiked cranium. He's one of my favorite characters. And Ian McKaig actually went to create Darth Maul for George Lucas, and you can see they're distant cousins, both got kind of spiked <laughs> craniums. Um, the, obviously, Zagor, the, the warlock of Firetop Mountain, is one of our favorite characters. Um, and who else have we got? Um, the, the shape changer from Forest of Doom, an innocent looking goblin, go talk to him, of course, he metamorphoses into this horrific thing that's going to rip your heart out, so uh, there we are. I think we've got time for just one more question, um, and we're going to go halfway up and then in three to the lady with a hand up, um, and... But please don't worry, because Ian's going to be outside. If you've got, I'm sorry you haven't had a chance to go to everyone. Ian and Mark will be outside, so please come up, have a book signed, ask a question, and chat. This is kind of similar to a previous question, but like, for either characters or campaigns, what's like the biggest contrast between your most profound character or campaign and then your most like jokey character or campaign? Your, your turn. Yeah, I mean, I I have a wide cast of NPCs, uh, and you know, I'm mostly DM, so character-wise, they're very personal. But my NPCs, I mean, I have uh, this is a very stupid in joke in high rollers, but we have a, a crazy wizard who I base on like the classic old school idea of a wizard, like blue robes with moons and stars and a big floppy pointy hat. Um, and he changes his name every time they ask it. So it's Zim Zam Zambalor, Zam Zim 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 Zam. You know, it's just a ridiculous amalgamation of that. He's horrible, he's an awful old man, and he is terrible. Um, and he's just a joke that I got fed up with the players annoying me, and so I made this character to wind them up. And they loved him so much that he's become a recurring thing now. Uh, versus my... I, I tried really hard to write an incredibly morally gray, complex villain with Callus, uh, Valkyrian, the Empire, the Emperor of Astral Space. And he's kind of like a mixture of Darth Vader and sort of, uh, you know, a, a Dune character almost. Um, and he's very complex and got this big backstory and the players hated him and they loved him. And by the end of it, they weren't sure if they, were, they wanted to be friends with him or be enemies with him. And it was, it was a really satisfying conclusion to all of that. You know, that was a character I really tried hard to make quite cool uh, versus the stupid idiot wizard who's just awful. Um, but there's been many. There's Smeek the Goblin who couldn't speak common. So we'd just be like, ah, blah, 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 blah. and that was it. That was the whole character. There was nothing else to him. Um, they loved him. So yeah, it's, it's the, the duality of being a DM, I suppose, you know. Um, yeah, that was it for me. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Um, as I said, Ian and Mark will be outside. Thanks for being a fantastic audience. I'm sorry I didn't get to all your questions, but it's been a really, really lovely event. Thanks to the British Library for putting it on. Um, see you again next time.